slides? Yeah, yeah I'm working. Okay. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk about work that I did um, with John Bertram while I was doing my PhD dissertation at the University of Calgary. Um, I'm currently working with Craig McGowan at the University of Idaho. And so I just started the talk by asking why we need a general cost function at all. And uh, perhaps a practical answer to that question is we'd like to be able to predict the metabolic costs of an activity based on uh, biomechanical data. As anyone who's ever taken metabolic data knows, it's a slow process at best, and in some cases, you know, such as overground running, it's a very difficult process. Um, and another reason we might want to uh, get a general cost function um, would be to test our understanding of the mechanical and physiological factors that contribute to the metabolic cost of locomotion. So uh, which bouncing gate do we study if we're interested in um, in getting a general cost function for bouncing games. Um, we can study running. Let's see. Is this working? Ah, there it is. Okay. We can study running, trotting, hopping forward, or um, I chose to study hopping up and down. And so, we're so vertical human hopping. And so, why is vertical human hopping a good model for bouncing gates in general? Um, it uses the same basic leg compression extension motion as in running, trotting, and forward hopping, um, but it's mechanically simple. Um, there's no horizontal motion or leg swinging to complicate things, and the technique is not an issue. Basically, everyone hops in the same way. Also, uh, humans are easy to instruct. So uh, my basic approach to this problem was to me measure metabolic energy expenditure by oxygen consumption and mechanics, um, in this case force play, over a wide range of height frequency combinations. Um, and then uh, I predict metabolic cost using cost functions that are based on muscle mechanics and muscle physiology and compare experimentally measured and theoretically predicted metabolic cost. And then select a cost function that best explains the data after that comparison. Um, so now onto the metabolic energy expenditure measurements. So just to orient you a little bit, these are um, graphs uh, showing the uh, individual data points um, on height, up height and hop frequency axes, and these lines are um, contour lines like on, you see on a topographical map, and they um, show, in this case, the metabolic cost per hop is decreasing as you get towards higher frequencies and lower hop heights. I'm also going to show you cost per time graph, and that may seem a little redundant right now, but later um, it'll become apparent why the usefulness of showing different types of metabolic costs. So again, uh, we see roughly a similar trend. Metabolic cost uh, is lowest up here and highest up here. And for metabolic cost per height, though, we see a somewhat different trend. Um, the lowest costs are at high frequencies and high hop heights. Sorry to interrupt, what do we stop that? Um, that's a single data point um, for an individual. So it shows the frequency and the height that they attained um, a certain metabolic cost. Because people are wondering, sometimes often people look at those graphs and they say, uh, "Well, you know, you have all these, you have all these cost contours, but where, you know, wh what's the, where are the data points that you actually base this, these cost contours on?" And it does, you know, cover the full range of, um, you know, the full area that I'm getting cost contours. So now uh, on to how we how we uh, developed a cost function that predicts um, metabolic cost. Um, so some possible so sources of metabolic cost per hop are, are of course, muscle work. So uh, active muscle work um, in particular. So energy is required to lift the body. And some of this energy can be stored um, and returned by the tendons which at no cost, which will reduce the, the cost of uh, doing work. But the rest must be supplied actively by the muscles. Um, another source of, um, of metabolic cost is muscle force. And, um, so there's been uh, different types of uh, aspects of muscle force that have been correlated with metabolic cost. Um, one is muscle force magnitude. Um, so this is the muscle force magnitude is correlated with metabolic cost per hop. Um, and, this, and the logic behind this is that larger active muscle volume is needed to produce more force. And this is actually uh, what Kram and Taylor proposed in their Nature paper, um, although they worded it a little bit differently. They worded it as force rate is proportional to um, metabolic cost per time. And then because, um, instead of cost per, 
the, the force magnitude is proportional to the metabolic cost per hop. And then um, here we have force rate is another possibility. So more energy is needed to pump calcium to turn muscles on and off rapidly. And Arcuo and uh, Jesse Dean uh, used this in a 2008 and 11 paper about ankle bouncing. And then muscle impulse is another possibility. Um, so a larger active muscle volume and a longer duration is, would cost more. Um, and this was used by McMahon et al. in the Groucho running paper. And so how do we get from, um, so how do we actually calculate or estimate um, muscle force based on the data that we've collected. So in this case, I collected force plate data um, and got ground reaction force and center of mass trajectory. Um, and from that, um, I can use leg geometry um, and this simple segmented leg model, which consists of a point mass body, um, a knee extensor muscle, um, a massless leg that's jointed at the knee um, with a certain uh, radius um, for the knee. Um, and by balancing moments about the joint, you can cal calculate muscle force based on ground reaction force. Um, so uh, this is just a little bit more about the actual equations that I use to calculate um, these various parameters. So for muscle work, I calculated external work and tendon work and took the difference to get muscle work. Um, for muscle force, uh, I calculated muscle force magnitude. Um, using the model that I showed previously. Muscle force rate is based on muscle force divided by time, and muscle impulse um, is uh, the integral of muscle force with respect to time. And so now we go on to the comparison of measured and predicted metabolic cost. Uh, so these graph, this graph may be kind of intimidating, uh, tons of dots, uh, lots of graphs. I'll kind of walk you through it. Um, so for external work, uh, we see that metabolic cost per hop, um, the experimental uh, cost per hop correlates pretty well with, um, with, uh, the, with external work um, and has an R squared of 0.73, a uh, little bit worse of a correlation in terms of metabolic cost per time. And for metabolic cost per height, uh, we of course get a lousy correlation because uh, you essentially are dividing MGH by H and there's of course no correlation. Um, so this, this, this uh, example, in fact, illustrates why it's important to show all three versions of metabolic cost when you're trying to um, determine which cost function best fits your data. Um, so here is tendon work. Um, um, here is metabolic cost correlated with tendon work. And we see rather poor correlation um, in all cases. Um, in muscle force, similarly, not so great correlation. And muscle force rate, um, not so great correlation either. Muscle impulse, uh, we get the best correlation um, of R squared of 0.92 for um, metabolic cost per hop, not so bad for metabolic cost per time, and uh, pretty good for metabolic cost per height as well. Um, but what if we combine, so this would be the best um, combination overall out of these uh, possibilities so far. But what if we combine some of these um, different uh, sources of work, or sources of metabolic cost? So um, here's the possible cost functions. So muscle impulse was a pretty good cost function. Muscle work was a decent cost function. Uh, but what if we add, say, muscle force to muscle work? Would that be even better? Or muscle work to muscle force rate? Uh, or muscle force rate, or muscle work to muscle impulse. So in these cases, it's a muscle a work term and a force production term. Um, so in the case of muscle work plus muscle force, um, we, we can cross that one off the list um, because we get a negative correlation, meaning that metabolic cost decreases with increasing muscle force, which is opposite of what you'd expect from a physiological standpoint. Um, similarly, we can cross um, muscle work plus muscle force rate off the list, uh, also a negative correlation, which is not physiological. And uh, muscle work plus muscle impulse, in this case, the negative correlation um, is with muscle work, um, but again, non-physiological, so we cross that out. So now we're going to go back to the muscle impulse and the muscle work cost functions and compare those in more detail. Um, so for muscle impulse, we get really nice, um, fairly linear relationships. 
for all three types of metabolic cost. Um, but for muscle work, um, we get um, that there is a nonlinear correlation for um, the uh, muscle meta for metabolic cost per height case, and the correlation is very low, and the range of da data is too small. So the range of metabolic costs covered by the data are too small. And these graphs um, just show on a more qualitative um, comparison of the cost contours for muscle impulse and muscle work. And again, we can still see that the muscle impulse um, does a better job of explaining the data. And in conclusion, uh, metabolic cost per hop is proportional to muscle work. Uh, so metabolic cost per hop is determined primarily by the cost of producing force for a given length of time. Um, and we also find that metabolic cost per time, which is what people tend to discuss, um, is proportional to one over the effective mechanical advantage. And what that really means is that the greater the bend in the knee, the more muscle force uh, or muscle volume is needed to support body weight, and therefore the higher the metabolic rate. And I'll just leave it there things up for questions. We have time for a few questions. Hi there. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you went through this list of uh, five combined models. Mm -hmm. for recovering the cost of muscle force production. Um, I mean, there is the opportunity for recovering uh, work um, through elastic energy storage in return. Um, so I guess from that standpoint, um, I decided that uh, muscle, that, I, I, yes, there is, there, there is, I, I was looking for the best cost function, and I didn't want to um, just say out of hand that these were inappropriate, um, but I would say that um, I can't see a way of justifying that producing force, more force, would co would cost less from a metabolic standpoint. Um, can you give an example? I'm, I, I, I'm just trying to think of what you're getting at. Well, the total muscle work and the muscle force are not independent quantities. If you were to increase the muscle force over a shorter duration, I mean, I can imagine, um, I mean, there's no reason to think these are sort of additive costs and that, that if you, if everything couples through the whole cycle, so I mean, it sort of seems sensible that if you're just adding things into a regression, it sort of comes to a fit that some of these coefficients can end up being. Yeah, I, 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 I don't get that quite offhand, but I'd like to talk to you more about that. That sounds very interesting. What do you think if you included them? Would you get better fits? If I include them? Um, so, so, if I, so do I get a better fit, say, if I include muscle, muscle force rate um, and work, do I get a better fit overall? Yeah. Yes, I get a slightly better fit. Not a, not a hugely better fit, but a slightly better fit, yes. So some of those you threw away, um, not better than muscle impulse, but they fit it better than just muscle work. Okay, so you're still your best fit. In order to look again, your final conclusion that your best fit is muscle impulse, you didn't need to cross the cost. Um, I, I suppose not. I suppose a lot of people um, ask me specifically about those reviewers and such, ask me specifically about these, so it seemed to be something that people were interested in, so I put it in. and. Um, yeah, I would argue. I would. I would agree with you. But I, you know, I think people want to see um, that these other things don't work as well. So. Um, yeah, Simon. No, no, no. Um, the, I mean, one. I, I put these five in um, because these were these were sensible um, uh, sources of. 
of metabolic costs, at least I thought they were sensible um, sources. And um, also, um, I, I would say I, I, um, I didn't think that all three sources of uh, metabolic costs due to forest production were equally sensible, but they were all things that people had thought long and hard about and had um, considered. And so I figured I ought to give them a fair shot. Um, Oh, you're saying if I included more force models to my, like just tacked on more and more and more? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, did, I did look at that at one point and I did sort of see diminishing returns. Um, I, I think it probably did see minor increases in you know, improving the fit. Um, but that, yeah, that's a reasonable question. I mean, one, one thing is, you know, are certain um, aspects of force more important in different regimes? And that's, you know, a possibility, so. Manoj? I, I think we're out of okay, time. Okay, I'll talk to you later. All of you that are interested in talking to Anne, come find her afterwards.